after years of neglect, my family tried to force me out of my own home to make room for my entitled brother, but I fought back and kept what's rightfully mine. I'm a single man in my early 30s, and my brother, who is 29, already has four kids. He became a father at 22, followed by another child a year later, then a third two years after that, and his fourth was born just a few months ago. My sister-in-law and I don't get along. She constantly provokes me by acting superior, and when I retaliate, she becomes a dramatic victim, crying on cue and garnering sympathy from everyone around her. Despite knowing her true nature, my parents and brother adore her. I'll admit she's very attractive, but her personality is so awful that I could never be attracted to her. She refuses to work, even though she has a college degree, and my mother takes care of the kids all day. Their finances are solely dependent on my brother, forcing them to live at my parents' house due to their limited income. Privacy is a serious issue with all of them crammed into a three-bedroom house from the 60s. My younger brother was always the favorite growing up. We're three years apart, but he developed a superiority complex because any retaliation from me was met with severe punishment. It was clear my parents favored him, giving him more of everything unless other family members intervened, which they often did. This led my parents to move us 150 miles away from our extended family to avoid scrutiny, resulting in us only seeing them on holidays. My brother was physically abusive, flirted with my first girlfriend until she broke up with me, and laughed at any of my misfortunes. My parents' advice was always to suck it up. They only treated me equally when they wanted to maintain appearances. It was almost amusing to see their discomfort when they had to treat me the same as my brother on birthdays and Christmas in front of others. Our nosy relatives loved gossip, so my parents worked hard to hide the reality, threatening to take away my possessions if I spoke out. When I turned 18, they celebrated my move out. Even though I hadn't finished high school. Couch surfing was better than living with them. They didn't attend my high school graduation, but I didn't mind. Since then, I've only seen my parents and brother on holidays like the rest of the family. The 2020 pandemic hit me hard. I lost my job and couldn't renew my condo lease because my roommate also lost his job and we couldn't afford the rent on unemployment. I loved that two-bedroom condo. As the lease ended, my roommate moved in with relatives and I had to sell almost everything I owned to avoid homelessness. I shouldn't have rented such an expensive place, but I enjoyed the high life until it turned on me. I realized I should have chosen a cheaper place to save more money. I came up with a plan. I owned a truck because I love trucks, so I bought a $1,000 camper in good condition and attached it to my truck, planning to live in it temporarily. But I ended up living in it much longer. I initially hoped to park it at my parents' house, where my brother and his family lived. When I asked my parents, they said their house was full and we hadn't gotten along for the past decade. They would only let me park there if I paid rent equivalent to an apartment in my area, which was unaffordable for me as a jobless person trying to save my unemployment money. I might as well rent an apartment with that price. My parents called my camper an eyesore and told me to leave since we couldn't agree. My sister-in-law found it hilarious that I had to live in a camper and my brother joined her in mocking me, calling me a homeless bum. I parked in a store parking lot that first night, scared out of my mind that someone might try to break in. I barely slept. I had nowhere else to go. Other relatives lived far away and my friends lived in apartments. I was attached to my area and didn't want to leave. I forwarded my mail to a friend's apartment, my only way to receive mail. Finding a stable place to park was quite a challenge. I spent months living a nomadic camper life while searching for a job similar to my previous one. During this time, I encountered numerous difficulties, from dealing with beggars and drug addicts to people demanding I leave because they considered my camper an eyesore. Once someone claimed to be part of an HOA and told me to move, even though I wasn't parked near any houses. When I questioned which HOA, they became aggressive and threatened me, so I moved to avoid trouble. To maintain a steady supply of electricity, I learned to use a long extension cord to recharge my camper batteries by plugging into any available outlet. This often meant sneaking around and using an outside outlet of a random building while parked on the street. Though I know it's not ideal, I needed to keep my refrigerator running. I had a small solar power bag for my phone, but I didn't have a generator, which would have been noisy and required fuel. So I did what I had to do. After months of this lifestyle, I finally secured a new job. I had to move to a neighboring city to find a non-retail job. I had promised myself never to work retail again after college, but I was close to breaking that promise. Although I was still receiving unemployment benefits, I had no stable place to live and didn't want to be jobless when the benefits ran out. Plus, I was incredibly bored with only reading, watching movies on a small portable DVD player, using my phone or laptop, and keeping track of where I could park and use public bathrooms. I envied the Japanese for their public bathhouses, which we could really use here. 
When I landed the job, I practically lived in the back lot of the building, in old employee parking spaces by the warehouse that no one else used because they were so far back they were almost forgotten. My boss, the company owner, liked this arrangement because I was always available for any shift as long as I had enough sleep. He even let me detach the camper from my truck and set it up in one of the spaces so I could drive around without it. I'm not sure if this was legal, but no one bothered us the entire time I lived there. I had few issues with trespassers, the security guards handled them. I was essentially on call all the time and worked nearly every day. My boss allowed me to plug my camper into the building for power and water, and I paid a small rent by working for free on Sundays, when the office was empty except for the janitor and security guard. I showered at a friend's apartment or at my local gym since the camper had no shower and only a portable toilet. I avoided using it to keep from having to empty it, a nasty chore, so I used other bathrooms whenever possible. I had a key to the warehouse and could use the bathroom there at any time. I became close friends with the night security guard. Heating the camper in winter was easy with a small electric heater, but summers were tough. Without AC, I got a used portable air conditioner to make it bearable. I earned a lot of overtime and learned new skills from my coworkers. Eventually, midway through the year, I was promoted to supervisor and started earning a better salary. This made me realize I needed a stable long-term living situation. I found a three-bedroom manufactured home on a small property just two miles from work. I bought it for $10,000 less than the asking price, using nearly all my savings for a down payment and getting approved for a home loan. I no longer had to live in a camper. There was enough space to park my truck and set up the camper in the backyard, where it could serve as an extra space if needed. Once settled, I made the mistake of bragging about my new home on Facebook. My family saw the post, and that's when things got complicated. A few weeks later, my parents and brother, along with his family, showed up unannounced for a tour. I hadn't given them my address, so I still don't know how they found me. None of my friends admitted to telling them, and no family had visited me before, so I suspect they may have followed me home from work. It wouldn't surprise me. Once I opened the door, they practically barged in like a horde of overexcited tourists, immediately making themselves at home. They nosed around everywhere, and my sister-in-law kept flashing me this unsettling smirk. It wasn't until later that I figured out why, and it made me angrier than a bull on steroids stung by a hornet. My parents kept talking about how much extra space I had and how it was too much for someone like me who had no wife or kids. Sure, not now, but maybe someday. My brother kept pointing out that my house had more space than our parents and was closer to his job. Red flags all around I know. Eventually, my brother, let's call him Dan for simplicity, asked to speak privately. Everyone else suddenly left the room and gathered on the front porch, making me realize they had planned something. Dan said the house was too much for me alone and suggested that he and his family move in because his wife was pregnant with their fourth child and my house was much closer to his job. He pointed out that I already had the camper, so I could just live in that while they took the main house. Not once did Dan mention offering rent, even though he had a good job. He also talked about making changes and setting curfews, saying I couldn't just walk in any time without notice. If it weren't my brother, I would have thought he had lost his mind. But Dan had long since gone off the deep end, thanks to our parents treating him like the center of the universe. I tried to speak, but he kept talking over me, as if I had no say in the matter. There was no way in hell I'd rent my house to him or his insufferable wife. I might consider renting to others to help pay off the mortgage, but not to them. I had seen stories like this online but never thought it would happen to me. Yet my parents, brother, and sister-in-law were a perfect fit for the roles of entitled narcissists. So I picked up my phone, set it to record, and held on to it. Dan didn't notice or care. He kept waving his arms and listing all the reasons why he needed my house. He acted like it was a done deal and even tried to shake my hand. That's when I finally stood my ground and said, hell no, loud enough that Dan stumbled backward. I rarely raised my voice to him like that, as I was usually punished for it by our parents, but this was my house, not theirs. My resolve was unyielding. I stood up and told him that my house was not up for grabs, and acting like he could move in just because they wanted it wouldn't change that. I bought my house for myself, and it wasn't my fault he kept having more kids and had to live with our parents because he couldn't afford to move out. Dan got as close to me as he could without touching me and said I didn't deserve the house and that he needed a better place for his family. I laughed in his face, saying that was total bull because I worked hard to buy my house. Of course, I deserved it. Dan started yelling that I had no wife or kids and didn't need all the space, so I might as well give it to him. I told him I wasn't giving him anything, and he hadn't even offered to pay rent if he moved in. I'd still be covering the entire mortgage on my own house without being able to live in it. Then Dan said he shouldn't have to pay rent because his family came first. 
after I kicked my parents, brother, and sister-in-law out for trying to force me to hand over my new house, I immediately went on social media and told the whole story to the family. It spread quickly, but you won't find it now because it has since been deleted and my profile is private. I posted about it because I knew my family would twist the event to make me the villain, and I was right. But I had about an hour to get my side out first, and I had video evidence to back up my story. No, I don't plan on showing the video here, so don't ask. Being proactive paid off because I got a decent number of family members on my side right away. My parents, brother, and sister-in-law must have planned to write their own post, but it was too late, so they didn't even bother trying to lie much. They had a few supporters, but not many. Most of our family already knew how entitled they were, so they quickly understood and accepted what happened. One person, whose identity I don't know, called me to rant that I was a horrible brother and needed to make way for a real family man. I just ended the call and blocked the number. It didn't happen again. The week went by and my parents showed up with Dan on my front porch, just as they said they would in their ultimatum. They rang my doorbell like crazy and pounded on the door until I finally answered. I opened the door just a crack, and they tried to shove their way in again. But I had installed a couple of latch chains and braced my body against the door. My father and brother demanded I let them in, but I said I was recording everything on camera and would call the police if they tried to force their way in again. My mother calmed them down and, in her most sickly sweet tone, asked if I was ready to let my brother move in. I told them to foff and never come back. My mother put on the crocodile tears and asked why I couldn't just do this for Dan because he's my beloved brother. I laughed and bluntly said I don't love him as a brother because he treated me like crap for years, and they encouraged him to do so. They are terrible parents, and he is a terrible brother. Then I told them to leave or I'd call the police ASAP. They all left surprisingly easily, apart from my mother's loud crying and the others giving me dirty looks. One could say making them leave was suspiciously easy. I thought the whole mess was over, but I should have taken them more seriously because they had other stupid plans. I came home later that week on Friday evening to find a moving truck and my brother's minivan parked in my driveway. It was Dan and his family, they were moving stuff in. He waved at me with a crap-eating grin. I was furious and told him and his family to stop, but my sister-in-law smugly said that, like it or not, they were moving in. Then in the most fake way, while tilting her head and puckering her lips, she said it was okay because my mommy allowed it and I should always listen to what my mommy tells me. I seethed with rage just hearing those words and looking at her smug face, so I locked myself in my truck and called the cops right away. When they realized what I was doing, my sister-in-law started pounding on my window and yelling at me to stop, saying I couldn't do this to her because she and Dan needed the house. She cried, why can't you just do this for Dan? I responded, F Dan, it's my damn house, not his. Then she threatened to key the side of my truck unless I stopped calling the police, all of which the 911 operator heard thanks to the window being slightly open. I told my sister-in-law that if she damaged my truck, I'd sue her, and she was smart enough to retreat. When the police arrived, Dan, my sister-in-law, and their kids had locked themselves in my house. I explained the situation to the cops and showed them my new driver's license with my current address. When we approached the front door, I noticed they'd changed the lock, and the old one was lying on the porch with the center drilled out. The drill and a Harbor Freight drill bit set were left right next to it. Could they have been any more foolish, leaving evidence out like that? I pointed out the broken lock and the drill, then detailed the events that had transpired. It seemed Dan had called our parents, as they showed up while I was talking to the cops. My parents immediately lied, claiming I had agreed to rent my house to my brother and his family. I countered, saying that was an easily provable lie. Dan and my sister-in-law finally emerged from my house with some papers, looking smug as if they'd outsmarted me. They had drawn up a fake rental agreement, but my signature wasn't on it. There was a signature, but it didn't resemble my handwriting at all. I doubted they had ever seen my signature, which was incredibly stupid on their part. I pointed out that it was blatant fraud and that if the cops investigated it would be clear. I warned that going to jail and court wouldn't benefit them, and it could even make Dan lose his job, his only means of supporting his family. I also mentioned I would get a lawyer and sue for damages if anything of mine was lost, stolen, or broken, and I'd call CPS for good measure. Dan turned white and looked terrified, but my mother stepped between us, insisting I should do this for Dan and live in the camper so they could have a family home. I shouted at her that if she thought it was such a great idea, she should let Dan have her house instead. The cops separated my mother from me and I loudly demanded they all leave immediately, or I'd press charges. I declared that they drilled out my lock to break in, the lease papers were obvious fakes, they badly forged my signature and I had recorded video of my sister-in-law attacking me. These were felonies I could ruin their lives with if I wanted, and if they didn't leave, I would do just that. 
The only reason I hadn't already was for Dan's kids, so they had one chance to get out. My parents finally realized they couldn't force me to give in. My mother surrendered, saying she'd put an end to this. She spoke quietly to my sister-in-law while my father talked to Dan. My sister-in-law instantly started crying loudly. Ripping up the fake rental papers into tiny bits and tossing them like confetti, only to have an officer tell them to pick up the pieces or be cited for littering. The cops had, I don't get paid enough for this, looks on their faces. Dan had to start telling his kids to load their stuff back into the moving truck. The kids were all crying, with the eldest sobbing that he wouldn't get his own room now. My sister-in-law and Dan tried one last pathetic attempt to guilt me with a sad family routine, gathering in a group hug facing me. They must have practiced it beforehand. All the kids had the same pleading look with quivering mouths. My sister-in-law kept rubbing her pregnant belly and tilting her head to look pitiful, and my brother made the saddest face he could, saying, please don't do this. We need to be able to live here. But I didn't budge and told them to keep packing. All the kids and my sister-in-law turned up the crying, and Dan yelled, are you satisfied with yourself? You've denied us a home because you're too selfish to share and help out family. I laughed like a maniac and retorted that what he was trying to do was taking, not sharing, and no amount of crying would make me let his family move in. He was no brother of mine anymore. He was just an entitled prick who thought he could take whatever he wanted from me like when we were kids. Dan started f-bombing me until the cops warned him to cool it or he'd end up in cuffs regardless of whether I wanted to press charges. He looked both scared and supremely pissed off. I asked the cops if they could stick around until my parents, brother, and sister-in-law had all left, and they said they weren't going anywhere until the situation was resolved. In fact, within a few minutes, the two cops became four as more arrived for some reason. That gave my parents extra incentive to get moving. I made Dan give me the keys to the new lock he'd put on my front door, although I got a new lock the next day anyway because I didn't know if he had copies of the keys. He was really reluctant to hand them over and ended up throwing them down the street and into a storm drain, telling me to get them myself. One of the cops scolded him for that and made him retrieve the keys. Dan had to pull off the grate to get at them and got pretty dirty in the process. When he finally got the keys back, he grumbled and then slammed them into my hand. I then told them all to leave and never come back. My mother threatened to disown me for this, as if that were some kind of threat. I voiced that to them, and in an overly sarcastic tone said something like, oh no, that means I won't get to come to any holidays with you guys where I always get treated like crap because Dan has always been your favorite. You treated me so badly growing up that if Dan ever needs an organ donor, I wouldn't give him anything. So do like you always told me when I was mistreated and suck it up. Final update. Forward slash forward slash my parents told my brother to take my house because I don't have a family. I waited until after the new year to make an account and post, just in case more stuff happened, and it did. As previous readers know, my sister-in-law was making passive-aggressive posts on social media clearly directed at me, especially after she had her fourth baby in November. She kept posting the same repetitive nonsense, finding semi-clever ways to reword it but essentially complaining about living with my parents, the lack of space, and needing her own house. I know I sound dismissive, but after what I've been through with these people, you'd be ready to sarcastically play tiny violins in front of them too, they're just that bad. Since I waited until January to post, more happened, just as I thought. I mentioned before that I'd invited half the family for a Christmas Eve party at my house. Everyone I invited came, even though it was a three to four hour drive for them. They wanted to come and show their support. They praised me for working hard to get a house on my own and apologized for everything I'd been through. They asked why I didn't just take my camper and drive three hours back to them instead of living nearly homeless for so long, and I had to sheepishly admit I was very attached to living around here, where my best employment opportunities were. My hometown doesn't have many great job opportunities in my field, if any, and I wanted to make my own way as much as possible. An answer they overall accepted. We moved on to having a really nice party, the best I'd had in years. Some relatives brought CDs of great Christmas albums, and my favorite was the one my uncle brought of Ray Charles. He sings Christmas songs like no one else. It was a grand and happy time. I felt like, for once, I could just forget my past issues and enjoy the moment. But I wouldn't be writing this if it had stayed that way. About two hours into the party, you know who showed up. My parents, brother and sister-in-law walked in trying to look all smiles. They didn't even knock, just walked right in like they belonged there. I shut off the music and told them to leave immediately. They begged to stay and said they brought gifts. One of my uncles stood up and yelled at them before I had a chance to speak. He said they didn't deserve to be in my home or my life after the crap they pulled months earlier, and several other relatives backed him up. This uncle, my mother's brother, used to adore her until he found out about the stuff that went on between me and my parents. 
my grandparents, my mother's parents, as old as they are, hurriedly stepped in and told my parents that if they wanted to make amends with me, it was far too soon. They expressed their immense disappointment in them for the past year. They'd hidden their favoritism for my brother from prying eyes for a long time, but no one was fooled anymore. They needed to make a serious effort to treat me like a son if they ever wanted to be in my life again. Then they turned to Dan and my sister-in-law and said they were tired of the repetitive nonsense my sister-in-law kept posting. They told her to let it go already because my house would not become their new home. My sister-in-law reverted to her usual crying routine, throwing a tantrum about how she should be the one living here and not me. She sat down and complained that it wasn't fair I had this house to myself when I had no family, while she had four kids that needed more space. She just wanted a better place to live and feel like a real mom. It was petty of me, but I loudly pointed out that she sucked as a mother because she let my mom do most of the parenting while she sat on her but all day, playing on her phone or spending all of Dan's money. She had the nerve to complain about it. I even joked that I was surprised her baby didn't get drunk from her breast milk since she drank so much booze. That comment got me some stares. My sister-in-law demanded to know if I was calling her a bad mom. I said the evidence speaks for itself. If she wanted to afford to move out of my parents' house someday, she needed to use her college degree, get a job, and save money. My mom already did most of the childcare for my brother's kids, so she'd have plenty of time after her baby got a little older. My brother's eldest, a seven-year-old, ran up and started kicking and screaming at me for yelling at his mom. He kept at me about how his mom said I was the bad guy who made her cry and didn't let them live here. My brother pulled his son away, but the other relatives jumped back in, and it turned into a family intervention against my sister-in-law and brother. She was crying, her new baby was crying, her kids were crying, hell, even Dan was nearly in tears from the verbal lashing he was getting. He ended up just sitting on the ottoman by the front door, looking like a complete wreck. He couldn't look anyone in the eye. He couldn't even say two words to me, not with a house full of angry people ready to judge him if he tried to act like the golden child again. If they weren't there to hold him back, I bet this would have ended up like when he tried to take my house earlier. By this point though, he'd been so thoroughly humiliated that his and my parents' reputation in the family was completely destroyed because the masks were off. Soon after, my parents, brother, and sister-in-law all left in defeat. The party resumed, and we all avoided speaking of what had just happened for the rest of the evening. Since most of the adults had been drinking, everyone stayed the night at my house. I even let some of them sleep in the camper to ensure there was enough space. It makes a good guest house. My relatives had wanted a tour of it earlier and couldn't believe I'd been living in it for around two years. They asked a lot of questions about what summer and winter were like and so on. I was up earlier than everyone else on Christmas morning and had a fresh pot of coffee and some ibuprofen ready for those suffering from spiked eggnog hangovers. They complimented me on being a way nicer host than my parents ever were and we all agreed to do this again next Christmas. After Christmas, my sister-in-law finally stopped making posts that were obvious digs at me and even deleted the old ones. But shortly after the new year, she posted again, complaining about how she tried to convince my parents to get a camper like mine so it could be set up in the backyard. That way, Dan and his family could use the whole house as their family home. My parents vehemently turned down that idea. They were not going to be pushed out of their own home, let alone their master bedroom. The post was only up for a couple of days before my sister-in-law removed it and she has hardly posted anything since. She loves to complain, but if a tree falls and no one is around to hear it, can it still complain? My sister-in-law seems to have realized there's no point in doing it when no one is listening. And Dan can't afford to move his family out on his salary alone anytime soon. If they end up expecting another child in the next few years, I won't be surprised. Things have mellowed down for me since then, and I've even invited friends over for a poker night. I suck at poker because I can never remember the rules, but so what? We get to drink beer and eat junk food while being merry idiots. We loaded up on Whoppers from Burger King and just had a great time, enjoying the evening and getting pleasantly drunk. I think maybe around summer I'll look into possibly dating someone. I'm not exactly getting younger, so fingers crossed that goes well. My camper just sits idle in my yard now, and I admit there are days I go out there just to spend time in it. After living in it for two years, it feels like my second home. Maybe one day I'll actually use it for camping as intended. I've never been camping. My parents considered it a waste of time, so it would be a completely new experience for me. This pretty much marks the end of what happened. My parents, brother and sister-in-law have been staying clear of me. In fact, they've gone back to acting like I don't exist, just like before I bought a house. Not that it bothers me at all, it's better this way. But they'll inevitably come back in some way. I know they will. I just wonder what kind of stupid thing they'll do next. If anything notable like this happens again, 
I'll make another post if this account is still active. Thank you for watching, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real life stories happening around you.